Hello. Today I'm in Villa La Fonte for the FSR monthly interview and this time I will interview Professor Danny Ellerman, who is the Director of Climate Policy Research Unit in Loyola de Palacio Chair. Danny Ellerman is a leading expert of the European Union Emission Trading Scheme, a pioneering initiative and a cornerstone for the climate policy. The European Union Emission Trading Scheme allows factories to buy and to sell carbon emission credits. This reduces a government intervention and in the same time provides a financial incentive at the EU level to reduce greenhouse gases. Seven years after its launch, EU ETS has expanded to 30 countries, including all EU member states. So, is it working and has it had a global impact? Good morning, Danny. Welcome back to Florence. Hi, Magda. Great to see you. It's always a pleasure to come back to the EUI. Let's just sit down. Okay, thank you. So the first question would be, in your opinion, has the ETS been a success? Absolutely. Off the top of my head, I can think of four reasons uh, that I would put forward. The first of these is that a mechanism is in place to limit and to reduce emissions from a significant part of the European economy to whatever level proves politically feasible and desirable over the coming decades. Uh, that's much more than any other country or region of the world has done. There's lots of aspiration with respect to addressing climate change, but nowhere else have we seen the scale or the degree of ambition that we have in Europe in terms of actually going beyond aspiration to implementing policy. A second uh, reason for, su for this success is that this mechanism has created a price for carbon, something that was free heretofore and people wasted it in whatever way, but that price, whatever it is, enters into all operations and investment decisions uh, throughout the sectors of the economy that are part of the EU ETS, and this does have an effect. It, again, it's something we don't see elsewhere except for rare uh, exceptions. A third reason for its success is that it's demonstrated that a multinational trading system is possible and, and in fact feasible. And we have to keep in mind that although we frequently talk of the European Union as if it's a unitary state, it's really a very weak federation. And all of the member states enjoy considerable degrees of sovereignty, but yet they've all joined together in, in this endeavor. And by the way, it's the experience to date has shown that the carbon price doesn't wreck the economy. Now that's not to say that the European economy, like many others around the world, are having problems. But no one suggests that the current recession and crises are because of the carbon price. In fact, as a joke, I oftentimes make the comment that subprime mortgages in Florida have had a greater effect on the European economy than the carbon price in Europe. And the fourth and the last reason, not the least of the reasons I would point out, is that CO2 emissions have been reduced. I would estimate them at perhaps 5% less than they would otherwise be. And this is modest, but we should keep in mind that the initial ambition of the EU ETS is also modest. And I would suggest that this is what we will see everywhere as other countries adopt uh, emission trading systems and those that have, such as in Australia and other places, they all start off with a modest level of ambition and then get more demanding as time goes on. So if it has been a success, why are there so many people complaining about it and proposing some adjustment into it? Well, the main reason is certainly price. The price is a lot lower uh, than what anyone expected as little as four or five years ago. Now, there's some irony in this in that we're in a big recession and normally people think that uh, a lower prices are a good thing, uh, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. And I think we need to keep in mind that if our target is, for instance, that emissions in 2050 are 80% lower than they were in 2005 or 1990, and if expectations of economic growth are reduced, as I think quite clearly they have been over the last five years, then that means less needs to be done in way of abating emissions in order to reach that 80% uh, reduction target. And that necessarily implies a lower price. Now, of course, if expectations change again, so as probably everyone hopes that 
at some point, a few years out, maybe we'll return to sort of robust economic growth and people are expecting that gee, Europe is gonna grow at a, let's say a percentage point more than what they expect now or something like what the expectations were around 2007, then we'll see the prices go back up again. Uh, because more is going to be needed given that economic growth to meet that 2050 target and the price uh, will be higher. Now I wouldn't argue that there are also other causes like the offsets have reduced the price and we've also seen the incentives to promote renewable energy have also reduced demand for allowances and that's necessarily reduced the price. But I would suggest that these are more temporary influences and we see changes taking place that'll do those, where the more fundamental issue is this change in expectations of economic growth that implies a lower price. Well, at some point there were many people thinking and hoping that there will be also other countries following the European example, for instance, the United States. But this is not really the case. This is not really what happened. And why, why are we still forcing the EU leadership if this is not what is happening in the world? That's a good question. I would note that leadership is lonely and that it involves more than setting an example and telling other people what to do. In particular, one has to inspire and persuade. And I think Europe has been doing a pretty good job of this. The U.S. is going to do whatever it's going to do in its own time, and I don't think there's a whole lot that Europe can do other than demonstrating these systems work and they don't wreck the economy. And I give European leadership a lot of credit for not carping and complaining about the U.S. failures. And instead, they're really focusing their attention on China, Australia, and East Asia in general, and the degree to which the EU has been educating and working in China on working with the Chinese to set up emission trading systems is really impressive, uh, as is also the link with the Australian system that will start in uh, 2015. I think this is leadership at its best, and the fact that it's not widely recognized, I think, speaks and attests to the quality of that leadership. Uh, so we don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot to be done uh, to establish these links, but uh, I think everything's moving in the right direction and the uh, EU is doing what it should as a leader. It's frustrating, but that's life. You seem to be very optimistic about it, but does the ETS face any problems? Of course it does. All policies uh, face problems, and sometimes those problems uh, overshadow the accomplishments, at least in the, in the uh, public mind. Um, I think there are two problems that I would point out. The first is how the ETS interacts with other climate policies. Uh, in some ways, some of these policies work counter to each other. At the very least, they don't add anything from the standpoint of greenhouse gas emissions. The second problem, I think, is simply staying the course. The true disaster from the standpoint of global efforts to address climate change would be for the European Union to abandon the ETS or for it simply uh, to fail. Uh, all of the alternatives, uh, or if we think of what would be the alternatives to a trading regime uh, for the world, uh, a global carbon tax or some sort of coordinated system of standards and mandates, none of those are gonna work as well uh, and they're not, they're more technically complex to implement, uh, and they're not as politically feasible. So I think things are headed in the right direction, but I'd be the first one to admit that there's still a long way to go. Thank you very much, Danny, for your time. It's good to know that we can look positively to the future. If you would like to hear more from Danny Ellerman, please join us on the 9th of October at 11 a.m. for our FSR webinar. This time he will tackle an issue of decarbonization in the European Union and in the United States. And in order to register for this event, please go to our FSR website or contact me directly by using the email that you can see right now on your computer screen.